A hostile army is marching towards your homeland. They come with siege engines, artillery, sappers, and all sorts of equipment you definitely don't want to be seeing used in front of your city gates. Intelligence suggests that they come to lay siege to your city. The people of your town rely on you to stand strong. The best defensive military technology of the time, the Star Fortress, is at your disposal. You must defend it at all costs. But how do you actually do this? Whether you happen to be a military engineer, a 16th century general, or just an interested history buff. In this video, we will provide you with the necessary knowledge to defend a star fortress forever. Choose your location wisely. Whether you build a fortress shaped as a star or not is secondary to where you build it. The most crucial element of the defense of a fortress is most probably water, both as a barrier and means of attack. Almost all hard-wearing fortresses were built near rivers, lakes or the sea. The Dutch in particular were masters of the watery defense. With their low-lying country, large parts on sea level or even lower, they developed several very efficient ways of exploiting the power of this element. One of the most spectacular examples is the siege of Antwerp in 1584 and 85. Antwerp is situated at the river Schelde. When the Spaniards were attacking the town, they soon realized that they had to gain control over the river, because Antwerp was constantly receiving reinforcements coming in from the river. However, to prevent the Spaniards from coming closer to the town, the Dutch simply broke several dikes and flooded the lowlands near the river and the town. This way, their allies could bring their fleet to the flooded area, which resulted in a major sea battle. Flooding, as in Antwerp, was one of the most favorite tactics of the Dutch. However, they did not always submerge whole regions. During the Siege of Ostend from 1601 to 1604, the city's defenders swept away a major assault by opening a sluice, which created an artificial riptide. The water broke the lines of the approaching Spaniards and swept many of them into the sea. The others were captured on small dry spots along the beach and were easy pickings for the Dutch artillery. But even if water isn't used in such an offensive manner, it provides a natural barrier. Water makes it more difficult to seal off a city completely, and it makes it easier to provide it with supplies and reinforcements. This was utilized masterfully during the Siege of Ostend as well. The city, if you look at this map, was located far from the Dutch territories, amidst the Spanish Netherlands. But for almost four years, the Dutch regularly brought supplies and reinforcements past the Spanish besiegers into the town by sea. Alongside water, there are, ideally, several features of terrain that might help the defense. Difficult terrain such as cliffs, woods, hills or swamps can act as natural defenses and bottlenecks. To fully exploit all the benefits of the location, you need free sight. Thus, you'll need to cut down or burn everything that hinders your view. Trees, buildings and hatches. As a bonus, this will deprive your enemy from most natural covers. However, simply relying on the defenses of nature will not get you through a siege. Build your star fortress properly. The second factor you'll need to address are your defensive constructions. The experts to learn from in this field are military engineers. These men turn the cities into towers of strength by improving and erecting intricate constructions of earth, stone and wood. The backbone of polygonal fortresses were the bastions. A bastion had two faces that could accommodate several pieces of artillery. This could shoot approaching enemies from a great distance. The shoulders were built, as depicted here, to fire at the shoulder of the next bastion. This way, there were no blind spots in the defense. Yet the most essential strength of a fortress were the walls. They were relatively low and thick, so that they could withstand heavy artillery fire for a long time. This quality was needed direly in the early modern period, since artillery was widely considered the most important means of attack. At certain spots in the wall, elevated artillery platforms called cavaliers provided further space for cannons 
and could therefore increase the firepower of the defenders greatly. At the bottom of the wall there was a berm, or so-called fausse bre. This is a small alleyway which, together with a ditch, prevented attackers from attempting to take the stronghold by storm. If the ditch was filled with water, the bridges over it became artificial bottlenecks. This lesson was brutally learned by the imperial troops besieging the city of Mantua in 1629 and 30. When the imperials wanted to storm a bridge after a cannonade, they suddenly found themselves in front of the muzzle of two cannons loaded with grapeshot who then swept the bridge and killed a major part of the attackers. The Imperials fared much better during the Sabbat World Crusades, where they defended the Hive city of Vervenhive and repelled the Sokian forces at the Waver Gate. Wait, wrong universe. This is actually one of the greatest siege stories the Warhammer 40k universe has to offer. Written by no one else than Dan Abnett, Necropolis is, in my opinion, a must read for anybody who likes military sci-fi. There is no better place than Audible to listen to it, so thanks to Audible for sponsoring this video. What they offer is thousands of popular and binge-worthy audiobooks, podcasts and more. What I really like about their app is that it actually remembers where you stopped your audiobook. You can also use it offline and they even offer a sleep timer so you can fall asleep to some good old Warhammer 40k sci-fi. And it is all easily accessible in one app. This is a service I wholeheartedly recommend. From stories to lectures on history, you get so much out of it. And it is free for the first 30 days. Visit audible.com slash sandroman, link in the pinned comment and description, or text sandroman to 500 500 to get Audible right now, while also supporting our channel. Now, let's jump back to our universe. Another crucial defensive structure were ravelines, V-shaped outworks which protected the curtain wall from direct fire. After 1600, sometimes even further outworks were added. On the other side of the ditch, there was a so-called covered way. It was covered by the glacis, a parapet of a man's height, which on one hand covered the man fighting on the covered way, and on the other hand, and much more importantly, matched in angle with the top of the wall, so that an attacker could only fire at the wall from far away, which was much less effective. Therefore, the enemy was forced to take the glasses before attempting to breach the walls. However, walls only protected vigilant defenders. Many cities were taken by a stratagem of war. This was for example the case with the French city of Amiens, which was conquered by the Spanish in 1597. A group of them disguised as women and farmers and took carts loaded with nuts to the market. As they passed the city gates, they spilled the nuts all over the ground. Chaos ensued and people were swearing at the clumsy farmers while stealing the nuts. Taking advantage of the confusion, the intruders dropped their disguise and neutralized the guards at the gate. In less than half an hour, they had taken over the city. The combined defenses of nature and man enhanced the hardiness of a fortress massively, but stone itself would not stop a determined attacker. Make sure you stock enough supplies. The most common reason why beleaguered cities had to capitulate in the 16th and 17th century were hunger and thirst. This was the case, for example, in Antwerp, where several bad decisions led to an inadequate supply of grain. In contrast, the inhabitants of Breda were so well supplied during the siege of 1624 and 25 that one commander of the besieging Spaniards allegedly noted that the garrison of the town was fed better than his own army. How important food was in sieges is best symbolized when the inhabitants of Harlem resolved to psychological warfare and threw loaves of bread over the walls to show they could easily hold out much longer. The second vital stock was gunpowder. If your powder magazines were empty, you couldn't push back enemy approaches and they advanced towards your walls much faster. The amounts of powder and ammunition needed during a siege were absolutely insane. According to the Dutch historian Olaf van Nimwegen, the defenders of Ostend shot their way through an average of 2,000 pounds of powder on each day of the siege. 
therefore you better fill your powder towers to the brim. All in all, the most crucial lesson is that food and water are essentially a ticking clock. It is a matter of time until the town is starved into surrender once its supply routes have been completely cut off. If you want to succeed, you must keep your supply lines open. There are several cases in which the defenders managed this and could bring food and powder and even reinforcements to the city. Two examples for this are the siege of Ostend that has already been mentioned and the 21 year long siege of Candia. In both cases, the cities were provided with fresh troops and food by sea. However, it is difficult to keep these lines open and your enemy will do everything they can to intercept. The same goes for intelligence. Once your city is confined, you need to find a way to communicate with the outside world and sneak information past your enemies. This was done with success during the Siege of Vienna in 1683, when messengers successfully swam the Danube and sneaked through the Ottoman camp at night. Such missions came at great risk, though. With full granaries, well-supplied treasuries, filled powder houses and a constant flow of information, your chances to defend a fortress increase significantly, but the situation is not cut and dried just yet. Use your weapons well. First and foremost, get your artillery in place. Artillery was not only the most important means of attack, but also vital for a sturdy defense. You'll need to equip all positions on your walls, most importantly the bastions, ravelins and cavaliers. Constant firing at your enemy with artillery does not only inflict losses, but more importantly slows down their approach. When under fire, they cannot simply march towards your walls. They have to cover every step they make. Once they're within firing distance, they have to dig what is called saps. Saps were shoveled out zigzag ways, so that the guns of the fortress could not shoot along them. In addition, the attackers had to build redoubts, cover their trenches and erect artillery platforms. This slowed them down and multiplied the costs of the siege for them, because in addition to an army of fighters, they also needed an army of sappers. Along with artillery, there was one vital weapon, which is now rather unknown. Hand grenades. These were usually round bodies of ceramics or glass filled with gunpowder. An extensive use of hand grenades is reported for the Siege of Vienna, during which the Viennese relentlessly pelted the Ottoman attackers with such hand grenades. Another fiery piece of preparation you can't do without are explosive charges for your mines. The extent of explosives varied greatly, but they mostly consisted of barrels filled with powder. These were then placed under the target in a tunnel. Although mines were primarily an offensive weapon, a defender could not do without them either. Mine tunnels were not only a threat to the trenches and redoubts of the approaching enemy, but also indispensable to detect and destroy mines of the attacker before they could do major damage. This was demonstrated in the Siege of Vienna as well, when the defenders not only heavily invested in mine warfare, but also positioned a man in every basement with the sole purpose of listening to digging and tapping noises to detect mine attacks early. Another siege known for the extensive use of mines is the 21 year long siege of Candia. The Venetian defenders of the town blew up a major mine under the approaches of the Ottomans and later they blew up multiple of their own bastions in a last ditch effort after they had been taken by the attackers. Beware, however, the flip side of fire. One thing the defenders of a fortress must always keep in mind is firefighting. The initial cannonade of a city was often not aimed at the defenses, but the town itself, in the hope of stirring up an uprising against the garrison. Because of this, it is vital to reinforce buildings, especially their roofs, with layers of earth and have man and means ready to put out potential fires early. For example, the siege of Venlo in 1637 was lost because the besieging Spanish set the town ablaze, whereupon the inhabitants, quote, sought to take control of the person of the governor, of the arsenal and lastly of the gateway." End quote. They forced the governor to negotiate with the besiegers and Venlo capitulated the next day. So be ready to bring fire upon your enemy and extinguish fire within your walls. Do that 
and there's not much missing for a successful defense. Gather the able-bodied. You will need every hand and brain. Manpower is not only needed on the walls, but also in logistics, earthwork and numerous other tasks. Every hand within the walls, old people, children, women and men alike, are needed. Civilians often formed a militia and fought alongside the soldiers. One famous example for this is the Siege of Harlem in 1572, when a company of women under the lead of Kenau Simon's doctor Hasselar joined the militia and defended the town with steel in hand. But most importantly, a garrison with too few men will have its hands bound and will not be able to spare soldiers for extra tasks, such as sorties. Sorties were the core of a forward defense, but in order to launch one, a garrison needed a surplus of combatants, since only those who were not needed to secure the walls could be sent out and put at risk. A sortie could be conducted in various ways, but its main goal always was to weaken the position of the besiegers, for example by invading their trenches to destroy their earthwork and artillery. The success of a sortie depended on the element of surprise and the number of men deployed. The defenders of Breda, for example, launched a sortie against the Spaniards who were establishing an encirclement every other day. When such a sortie was executed cleverly, it was very likely that the shoveling Spaniards were caught on the wrong foot. In such cases, they suffered high losses and were often driven from their current position. Along with fighting people in numbers, it came in handy to have an experienced commander and an ingenious engineer. In multiple cases, the crazy siege engines of the engineers saved the day for a town under siege. One particularly spectacular example were the fire ships created by Federico Ciambelli during the siege of Antwerp. When the Dutch flooded the region, the Spaniards built a massive pontoon bridge. The engineers stuffed two ships with about 7,000 pounds of gunpowder, topped with a layer of improvised sharpnel, and swept the two infernal machines down the river towards the bridge. Moments later, an ear-splitting explosion tore apart the peaceful silence of the night. The debris of the Spanish bridge kept on raining down on the surroundings for several minutes. As for the deeds of commanders, let's venture back to the Siege of Ostend. Sir Francis Veer, an Englishman in Dutch service, commanded the defense of the town for most of the siege. After months of fighting, his men and the defenses were torn down to the point of breaking under the pressure of the daily attacks. In this dire moment, Veer learned that a major assault was being planned. Knowing that he could never fend off such an assault, he sought refuge in a risky stratagem of war. First, he offered parley to the Spaniards. He then drew out the negotiations for about a month to win time. Then, at last, on the very day on which reinforcements were finally arriving, he broke off the negotiations. With a town so crowded, limited access to clean water and inadequate sewage systems, diseases and epidemics become a major threat. It is therefore crucial to maintain strict hygiene, bury the fallen and create space for additional defenders to live and sleep. This was a problem during the Siege of Ostend when the men of the garrison had to share rooms in groups of 30 to 50. This caused widespread sicknesses and made the men in the overcrowded city easy targets to the Spanish artillery fire. A similar fate befell the defenders of Vienna as they were struck by dysentery. During the siege of Mantua, the defenders even brought the plague to the city from the camps of the attackers, who had retired to their winter quarters. In the end, the attackers returned and Mantua fell because the plague was ravaging in the city. Nonetheless, it is usually impossible to defend a city with only the tools, hands and brains within the walls. If you have no allies helping you out, no mighty friends influencing politics, a no relief army to harass the besiegers or even drive them off, you are almost hopelessly lost especially once your supply routes are cut. Take the example of Candia. The Venetian town on Crete held out against the Ottomans for 21 years. If the Venetians hadn't had the Pope lobbying for them and spreading the aura of a crusade all over Europe, or if they hadn't received numerous reinforcements of other European states by ship, 
it would have been impossible to resist for this long. Cadia eventually fell, but there are cities which were rescued by relief forces. The most famous example for this is the Siege of Vienna, in the defenders' most dire hour. With Ottoman mines under their walls, ready to be lit, the relief army arrived in the nick of time and stormed down the hill to drive the attackers back. In their most famous charge, the Polish winged hussars charged the Turkish lines and swept through their camp to save the day for Vienna. With enough manpower, reliable allies, and a capable commander and an ingenious engineer, you are certainly well prepared. Still, there are two more things to understand before you go to work. If you have been able to keep the big picture in sight while we were focusing on the details, you might be guessing by now that all the actions described so far aim at one single goal – winning time. This is on one hand because this video promised to teach exactly that – to hold out forever. On the other hand, this is because the only way to hold a fortress is by winning time. While your enemies slowly work their way closer to you, you have to do everything to slow them down, to fight for every single minute and every inch of ground. In the most extreme of defenses you could imagine, the defenders even resolved to a last-ditch effort. In the last moments of the Siege of Ostend, the defenders were digging another redoubt within the city center. This redoubt, made of earth, debris and bodies, was called New Troy. While most of the outer defenses were lost, some of the city was still being defended. Because of this, this siege is known as the Siege of New Troy. However, as soon as a place is completely surrounded and all ways of bringing in reinforcements and supplies are cut off, it is a matter of time until the defenders are starved into surrender. By meeting all the requirements above, you make sure that you're not conquered at once. And you may hope to stand strong until a relief army arrives, as for example at Vienna. If no help from the outside is on its way, then your only hope is to outdo your enemy in resources and simply wait until they can't afford the siege anymore. But we don't want to raise false hopes. All the examples mentioned, except for Vienna, were won by the attackers in the end. A determined siege almost always resulted in the fall of the fortress. However, losing a siege in a drawn-out conflict may be a loss for you, but it might be decisive for your homeland's war. Fortresses are not meant to be invulnerable. Their real purpose is to be horribly costly to capture. If you enjoy our content on a regular basis, please consider donating over on Patreon. We put a lot of time and energy in our videos, but because the early modern period isn't exactly everybody's favorite time period, the videos don't always do well with a wider audience. So Patreon is really the best place to help us out in the long run.